joining us today. I see a few familiar faces and it's, uh, it's great to see you all. I'm just gonna set up the PowerPoint here. There we go. I'll start my timer. So I'm gonna keep this to about 40 minutes and allow us some time for questions at the end. Uh, I hope I'm not going over a lot of material that you all already know. I don't know if there's any drain tile experts out there. And we've written and done programs about drain tile in the past, but this is gonna be a little different. I wanna put it in context, both in uh, the 1830s and 19th century, but also uh, what drain tile means today. And part of that is understanding uh, John Johnston and who he was and how he was operating. So um, he was a small farmer on the cusp of commercial farming, growing specifically for market rather than selling surplus and providing for his family. So his crops and needs were different from today, but the benefits of drainage have remained the same. Uh, today, 56 million acres of farmland in the U.S. have underground tile drainage. And that doesn't even uh, include the domestic use. Um, what we're going to be talking about is basically the same system that you may know as uh, French drains uh, around your house or in your basement to keep water out of your house. So that's 56 million acres of just uh, agricultural land. Uh, so in the Finger Lakes and on John Johnson's original land, uh, the crops have changed, but the benefits have, have stayed the same. So here is John Johnston as a young man, and we're gonna be talking about him a lot this year because 2021 is the bicentennial of when he came to Seneca County from Scotland. Um, he, uh, he was born in 1791. So uh, does that make him, I think 30 when he came here and he's credited as the father of tile drainage in America. And uh, he left Scotland in 1821 and uh, came to the Finger Lakes. He had a, a friend in the, no, excuse me, he had a relative in the area, I believe, who uh, recommended he come to central and western New York. And he stopped here. And then he traveled on to uh, Rochester and Chicago, which were both small towns at the time. This was prior to, particularly for Rochester, this was prior to the Erie Canal. So these were still kind of farm communities at the time. And then he came back to Seneca County. And uh, the, the star indicates on this period map uh, where he bought the property. And uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's uh, right adjacent to Ventosa Winery on uh, Route 96A, uh, just past Rose Hill. Uh, so when he came back, he purchased 112 acres on the east side of Seneca Lake. And his neighbors were Robert Rose to the north the original owner of uh, the Rose Hill Mansion property, and Kristen Keim to the south, who was a, a, a Pennsylvania German immigrant. And uh, that name should be familiar. The Keim family is still in the area and they're still farming, farming that land. I've got to remove my cat, sorry. So, um, so Johnson purchased land and got established and sent back to Scotland for his family to join him. And they had a perilous journey, uh, which is another story, but they arrived just in time to see uh, his first barley crop fail. And people had warned him against buying this farm. They said, um, you know, the land is terrible. You know, you're never gonna make any money off it. You should go someplace else. And this was pretty much the American approach to land use uh, in the early, part of the 1800s. Uh, we were America, we were on the move. If your soil was bad, you just went someplace else. That's how the Rose and Nicholas families came up here from Virginia. And uh, even people in this area uh, in the 1820s and 30s, if they didn't think their land was very good, they moved someplace else to Ohio or Michigan, which was the great Northwest Territory at the time. And in fact, there are some letters that even uh, Johnston was considering moving uh, the first several years he was here. He was thinking about maybe moving out to Michigan 
and Mrs. Johnson had a cousin in Albany, uh, excuse me, Alabama, who said, oh, you know, you don't want to go to Michigan, it's too cold, come down to Alabama. So um, people didn't really think about changing the quality of their soil until Johnson came along. So after his first barley crop failed, the first thing uh, Johnson did was to spread manure. He had purchased an existing farm that had uh, large piles of old rotted manure and labor was cheap so he could hire a man and a man with a horse and a cart to to spread it and it didn't cost him very much and to say this was not a common practice uh, throughout the early years of uh, Johnston's farming career he was kind of a neighborhood oddity people would always come by and ask him what he was doing and why he was doing it and the neighbors asked if all the folks from the old country liked to work in the manure and Johnston replied, all those who made anything raising grain did. So his, his reply usually had to do with money. He's like, yeah, I may look crazy, but uh, this will bring me money in the end. And uh, so on the left of the screen here, we have a, uh, a woodcut from Old Sturbridge Village showing uh, spreading manure, you know, getting it off the cart and then uh, spreading it evenly. And on the, on the right is a a uh, rather grainy photo of spreading lime, calcium carbonate. So that's what that's what his next step. After a year or two, he had enough money to buy uh, bushels of lime, and he spread it on the soil to uh, reduce the acidity. And he said these two things uh, would get you a long way to uh, having better crop yields. And then, of course, the third thing was uh, drain tile. So uh, I apologize if folks have uh, seen this many times before or not, but uh, this is just a very basic explanation of what uh, drain tile does. It artificially lowers uh, the water table. And the issue for Johnston and many people in Seneca County and uh, the Finger Lakes is either heavy clay soil or a mix of soil that uh, may retain uh, groundwater. So uh, for annual crops like like grains and hay and things like that, you plant in the spring when uh, the water table is high because it's uh, it's very wet out and the roots stop growing once they hit water. And that's a problem in uh, August, July and August when things get hot and the water table uh, uh, drops and the the crops can't grow any further, excuse me, the roots can't grow any further. So, what drain tile did was uh, what was lower that. So when they're planted in the spring, uh, they uh, they develop a strong enough root system that they can uh, survive uh, drought conditions. There were a lot of theories on um, how deep you should go. Uh, Johnson's reply was always uh, just dig down. Uh, the land will tell you uh, when you've gone deep enough. On average, it was about three feet, but uh, you would dig down and uh, lay in these uh, ditches of tile, which I'll show in a moment. There were um, there were a number of benefits to this, uh, as I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, the yield certainly increased, um, but you could also plant earlier and have uh, earlier harvesting. And maybe most importantly, you could get on your fields in wet conditions. Um, he would uh, he would be able to get out there and start plowing or uh, driving carts out on his field when everyone else was uh, still sinking up to their axles. So in 1835, Johnson uh, had been uh, have been farming for a little over a decade now, and he had uh, gotten enough money to start considering uh, drainage. And he always uh, put his land first. He wasn't somebody who uh, went out and uh, bought new things just because he had money. He was very uh, uh, disdainful of uh, farmers who made money and immediately got a new carriage or built a new house. He said, you take care of your land and your land will take care of you. So once he had some money together, he, um, he wrote to his family back in Scotland where they were already using tile drainage. 
and asked them to send two pieces of horseshoe shaped uh, tile that he could show the, to the local potters. And uh, the image on the left is um, one, one of the two pattern tiles that were brought here. And this was all, often called a shin bone tile as well, because um, there were a lot of different ways of making uh, these tiles. You could bend them over a wooden form or things like that, but also uh, it was just about the right uh, size and length of a man's shin bone. So you could take this elastic tile and do it that way if you so, so chose. So he got his uh, two pieces of tile and he went over to Waterloo to a potter named Benjamin Whartonby. Um, he said, you know, do you think you can do this? And he's like, sure I can. And this was good for Whartonby because he made redware, which was uh, falling out of favor. Um, uh, there were other types of clay pottery that were um, coming into fashion at the time. And also the other big problem with uh, redware in the 1830s was people realized that there was lead glaze on it and it was uh, killing people or at least having uh, health issues. So uh, his, his redware business was uh, failing just about the time that uh, drain tile came along. So uh, Johnson commissioned enough, uh, enough tiles to put on a 10 acre field and uh, his neighbors all thought he was crazy. They called it burying crockery in the ground. Um, it would either break the first time somebody drove over it with a heavy wagon or it would poison the soil or dry out the soil too much and all his crops would die. Uh, but Johnson was quite scientific for the time. Uh, he had uh, hundreds of acres at this point, but he just plotted out a 10 acre field that he thought was particularly wet. And he planted, uh, he planted wheat there. And then he also uh, planted wheat all around it. And he, uh, he tracked uh, the yield that first year. This is a netching off a uh, piece of presentation silver, I believe, that uh, Johnson was awarded. Agricultural societies in the 19th century, um, they wrote books and promoted a lot of ideas and they also award, uh, gave a lot of awards for uh, uh, best sheep, best cows, uh, things like that. So. Uh, he, he won a number of awards, and this is a pretty accurate description of um, how you um, how you laid how you laid tile. You uh, the ditch would be uh, the narrowest at the bottom, so you didn't have a lot of excess space. And the tool the man is holding is called a tile pick. Uh, it had a, um, a long extension on it at the at the bottom of the handle that you would slip through the uh, slip through the tile, and you would uh, lay them uh, end to end as close as possible. And that's how the water got into the tile lines. Uh, there'd be so much water in the surrounding soil that it would uh, force its way between the gaps into, uh, into the tile lines. This is an aerial photo probably from uh, 1960s, I think, or 1970s that shows uh, uh, Johnson's land at uh, at its at its largest. He had about 320 acres. So um, over here, I believe today would be um, uh, Ventosa, uh, and uh, here is uh, uh, Johnson House. And over here, I think is probably where uh, Bottomless Brewing is. So we have different accounts of. Um, how much drainage improved uh, Johnson's uh, soil the first year, but this comes from uh, Liberty Hyde Bailey uh, in 1893, who was uh, associated with Cornell. And he wrote, the wheat, which was John Johnson's leading crop, jumped at once from indifferent yields of 15 to 20 bushels to over 30 and often over 40 bushels. So um, doubled his yield uh, in, in the first year. So uh, on these 320 acres, he, um, as, I, as I mentioned at the outset, he was uh, uh, doing some commercial farming. His cash crops were wheat, uh, cattle, and uh, sheep. And he was selling the uh, cattle and sheep for meat. So um, um, 
all his grain crops that he was growing that he was concerned about improving the land for were um, corn, oats, and hay, which he uh, fed to the livestock. And he had a he had a good system that was uh, self-supporting. So he would uh, uh, plant all these grains uh, uh, in the in the spring and summer and harvest them. And then he would buy cattle and sheep in the fall. Um, one particular year, he had about uh, 50, 50 cattle and I think uh, well over 200 sheep that he was going to keep over the winter. Uh, he would feed them the grains and fatten them uh, all winter and then sold them in the spring. And meanwhile, they were producing all this great manure for his land, which he would compost and then throw it back on the fields in the summer. And it uh, just kept uh, supporting itself. Um, aside from selling wheat, he, uh, uh, he, he, he didn't sell his grains because uh, in this area, uh, in the 19th century, a lot of it was going to brewers and distillers. And he didn't drink and he didn't approve of that. And uh, needless to say, he had a lot of strong opinions and he always felt they were right. Uh, and so he had a lot to say about farmers who were selling their grains to, uh, to the brewer and the whiskey maker. And, uh, you know, they might as well just burn it instead. I imagine he probably wouldn't have a high opinion of having bottomless brewing next to his uh, old house. Uh, one possible idea for a program is having someone dress up as John Johnston and go out and lecture people as they arrive uh, at the brewery and throw rocks at them. But uh, we, we've tabled that idea. So um, these next couple of slides are a um, pretty good illustration of exactly how drain tile was laid out and how it worked. Johnston's son-in-law was uh, Robert Swan, who uh, in 1850, he married one of Johnston's daughters and uh, Swan's parents from New York City were so excited about this, they, they bought him a farm. They bought him Rose Hill Mansion, which was for sale and uh, the entire farm. So you can see in, in modern day terms, if down here is the Yacht Club and, um, so they owned on the, uh, on the other side of the canal. You know, if this is about where the bridge is, they, were, uh, they owned on the other side of the canal and uh, back here quite a ways. And then their next nearest neighbor was John Johnston. So um, they had hundreds of acres and commonly uh, farmers did not uh, draw maps where they put their drain tile. They didn't really think about it. They you know, they put it where they needed it and that information got lost along the way. But uh, as, I, as I mentioned, there were awards for things like tile drainage. So in 1853, Swan um, put himself up for one of these awards and had to uh, show a map of, of where his uh, tile was and, uh, and, and how it was working. So, his, uh, his wettest land was uh, pretty much right in back of the house. So if this is the house and you're standing on the back porch, you know, pretty much straight back here. Uh, it was an area that was described in the newspaper as a uh, uh, useless wasteland. It was just all wet and swampy and it wasn't good for anything uh, except frogs. Uh, of course, now we have a much different view of wetlands and we understand how they're important, but in some areas, like across the road here, there might just be one line with a few offshoots and that would be it. But in the wettest areas behind the house, uh, these, these red lines are called laterals and this would be the highest point. So the ditch is always running downhill. So um, your spacing between these laterals was entirely up, uh, up to you, like how wet the soil was and what you were gonna grow. They could be 50 feet apart, or they might be as little as 15 feet apart. Uh, so you've got the red laterals, and then they feed into uh, a slightly larger pipe. So the, the red ones might be two inches, this one might be um, you know, four inches, and that's gathering in all these other branches, and it comes down here. And then you have a large main ditch, which might even be an open ditch, or it could be a six inch pipe that uh, goes off and eventually, in this case, it would drain into Seneca Lake. 
but um, more commonly you might see them emptying into roadside ditches or or a pond or something like that. So this is Johnston uh, later in life. Um, he lived to be 90. He, uh, of the source I found said he retired in uh, 1877. So he would have been around the age of uh, 87. And he moved to uh, South Main Street in Geneva to live with uh, one of his daughters, uh, not too far from Proudy Chu actually. And he uh, passed away in 1880. And it was a, it was a simple ceremony and uh, there were no flowers. There was only a, a sheaf of wheat laid, up, laid upon his casket. This boulder was dedicated in uh, 1935. And I don't know how much uh, you may have noticed this. If you go out that way, it's right at the, junk, at the split of Route 96A and uh, East Lake Road. Um, it's been, uh, it's been trimmed around quite a bit. Some years, uh, there's a lot of uh, growth in front of it, but it's been kept trimmed lately, so you can see it. But a lot of people uh, you know, can't read it at uh, 50 miles an hour. Um, so this was uh, put in by the American Society of uh, Agricultural Engineers. And uh, eminent farmer and here originated Oh, John Johnson was the eminent farmer who here originated tile under drainage in America in 1835. Understandably, there's uh, there there have been uh, conflicting uh, conflicting views. Some people say, oh, somebody in New Jersey or Pennsylvania did it first, and so on and so forth. But um, there's uh, there's not a lot of fight for the tile for the title of uh, the father of tile drainage. So. He is commonly recognized. Uh, these next two shots give some idea of uh, the types of tile that were available. And this collection is now in our tile building out at the, um, out at the Johnson house. Uh, this was in Mike Weaver's uh, basement. He was a agricultural engineer in the uh, 1930s who started finding this out in fields and just started collecting it. Um, you have the older kind, which were the original horseshoe tiles. And then as they began extruding clay, you could do anything with it. There could be round, there could be uh, egg shaped, it could have eight sides, six sides, uh, and you know, be dome shaped and just all kinds of different combinations. And just like any other product, every manufacturer said that theirs, uh, theirs worked the best. And in terms of being the best, the goals were to uh, move water efficiently and you didn't want silt to build up because uh, if a lot of silt got in the line, uh, then it would eventually plug up and not work. So um, everyone, um, everyone claimed that they had the, uh, the best design, which is not unusual. So if you're out walking around on trails or across old farmland, you may actually see some of these uh, drain tiles in the wild. So here's a photo where a bank was cut away and was exposed. And um, we have this piece of, oh, it's, it's, it's probably a uh, uh, 19th century tile. It's hard to say because uh, there's uh, the, the, these tiles, uh, designs have been made uh, over years and years, so you can't just look at one piece of tile and, and give it a date. But uh, this is probably about three feet down, and it's uh, sticking out where the bank was cut away. And probably on the edge of an old farm uh, field, here is a uh, pack of wild drain tile sunning itself out in the sun. Uh, and I, I see, I see, Carrie likes that. Uh, where they were probably installing it, they just got done with it and left it, left it where it was. Um, these are the type of things that people still call us. Uh, either they find it on the edge of their property or they're uh, doing work uh, on their property and they dig up some drain tile and they'll call us. Um, 
we have between 300 and 400 pieces. I think we have uh, every type of drain tile that's been made, but uh, we never say never. You can always call us uh, with drain tile questions or see if uh, you found something uh, that we'd like. You can see uh, you you can see old drain tile lines uh, from the air at different uh, types at, at different times of year, um, particularly in winter. And uh, the, this is an infrared uh, uh, photograph of some of Johnson's original land. So um, the alternating colors here, are alternating types of crops, but particularly here in the center, you can. Uh, you can see where the lines go. And I don't quite understand it, but um, apparently his land was so wet that sometimes he did it in squares. So he had uh, lines running perpendicular to each other, I guess at different levels. And this is another one that uh, shows it even better. Of course, here uh, here is the lake. So uh, even in an area that probably um, has a downslope, you know, it does have a gradual slope to the lake, which you think would um, drain the land sufficiently, but it didn't. So um, this is great. You can see where, um, you know, you can see where these all come in together. Uh, I just have a few slides about modern tile. Um, once you know what to look for, you'll start seeing it everywhere. Um, we pass by it all the time and I shout drain tile and my son gets very embarrassed at me that I'm pointing it out. But um, uh, drain tile insulation went from being manual to uh, steam driven and then gasoline powered with kind of semi-automatic systems that would, uh, somebody still had to sit down in the ditch, but this machine would uh, give you, would had a giant rotating wheel and would uh, hand you the tiles. But uh, this is the current system that's laser guided and has the uh, plastic uh, drain tile, little slits cut in it that uh, just spools on and you can do hundreds of feet uh, at a time. As I mentioned, people never used to keep maps of it. Now, in addition to uh, laser levels and everything else, uh, installers will create GPS maps so they know exactly right down to you know a foot or so where they installed the tile. Uh, you may see a lot of spools like this. Uh, I usually don't see them on the side. Usually they're standing up. And uh, I should mention that there's not a lot of new uh, installation going on on land that's never been tiled. Uh, there might be replacement work, or in some cases, um, either the land or the crops that are being planted have changed. So instead of a 50 foot spacing, they may want um, a lateral line every 15 feet. So that's a lot of what you're seeing now is uh, just uh, continued improvements rather than uh, people draining wetlands like they were in the uh, 20th century. So you might see this laying out in the field or um, on a wagon going down the uh, uh, going down the road, and they can pretty much install any time uh, that the ground is soft enough to dig. And uh, in the summertime, if you keep an eye out uh, for a ditch, um, if you see a plastic pipe uh, emptying water into a roadside ditch, that's drain tile at work. And it doesn't point out it. Uh, I just noticed this myself. You can't see it real clearly, but there's a metal grate across this because uh, the three biggest obstacles to drain tile are silt buildup, roots coming in from trees that are seeking water, and uh, rodents and small animals getting into the pipes. So they have a little uh, a rodent guard there to keep them from running in. So now I want to address the, uh, the original title here from grains to grapes uh, to talk about how uh, crops have changed over uh, over years, beginning with what's been grown on um, what's been grown on Johnson's land over time. So in 1870, uh, Seneca Nurseries uh, was formed by 
uh, one of the partners was this man here, James Sears, and uh, Nurseries in Geneva is a whole another story that we've done exhibits about and books about before. Um, but they, uh, uh, they purchased part of Johnson's land and began growing out there. Um, the American fruit culturist in 1875 recommended that every complete nursery should consist wholly or in part of a strong loam or loamy clay, which will in general require previous thorough tile draining. And the Geneva Gazette in 1872 uh, was promoting Seneca nurseries and said the trees offered for sale are mostly raised on this splendid piece of land. The results of thorough cultivation and systematic draining are here plainly seen in the large, vigorous, stocky trees, which are now produced in place of the field crops raised under Mr. Johnston's management. So if, if drainage was great for, uh, if drainage was great for annual grain crops, it was even better for uh, perennials like um, uh, trees and bushes and uh, eventually grapes and things like that. Because, um, you know, if you've got something that's uh, in the ground year round and uh, you want to avoid root rot and just, you know, general problems from too much moisture. So the next owner of uh, at least part of Johnson's land was Mr. Charles Rose Mellon. And he has his, uh, he's very proud of the sign out here. He, uh, he bought some of the land or bought the farm in um, 1880 from Johnson's daughters. And uh, I don't know exactly how long he had it, but um, he boasted in 1912, uh, it was very wet that year, the entire, the entire growing season. And he successfully planted and harvested a bumper yield of crops. And uh, most importantly, he could haul, uh, uh, a wagon load almost 7,000 pounds across the field when on his neighbor's farms, uh, the soils were too soft for even a mower to cross. So this is a, this is a great picture that he, that he had here. Uh, the next owner that I'm aware of was uh, Bert Welch, who some people may remember. He uh, owned the land from 1944, I think up until Oh, we got the, um, his, uh, his estate uh, sold us the Johnson house. So he had a, um, he had a number of barns on his property and he had a large dairy herd and he pretty much had a similar operation to Johnston. He grew wheat for cash, but then he grew all of his own, uh, all of his own feed for the, for the cattle and the, and the dairy cows. And uh, at some point, the Kime family bought some of Johnson's land. Um, they owned particularly, uh, well, they owned the land and the barn that uh, Bottomless Brewing is on now, but they also owned a lot of land uh, on that side of the road. And they've grown corn, soybeans, and hay on that, um, on that land for many years. So not too much of a departure uh, from Johnson until the early 2000s, when Lenny Cicery uh, bought the land on the west side of the lake, at, excuse me, the west side of the lake road, and um, he came up planting grapes. He uh, planted it in stages, but now he's um, uh, got quite a few varieties, both north and south of the uh, Ventosa building. Johnston probably wouldn't think too much of this. Uh, you can't feed grapes to your uh, sheep and cows. Uh, and if he saw some of the carryings on that uh, go on at uh, wineries on uh, tour weekends, he would, uh, would not think much of that at all. But it has, um, uh, it has worked out very well. They, uh, um, the grapes grow there as well as any place else along Seneca Lake. And, um, as I mentioned, uh, a, uh, a Cornell Agritech specialist told me grapes like to keep their keep their feet dry, because I assumed that uh, particularly around the lakes are already planted on sloping land that have glacial till. And he said, no, uh, drainage still helps. It makes it even better. And just a quick note about uh, uh, the Rose Hill land. 
Uh, this is uh, across the road from Rose Hill Mansion, which for many years was a hayfield. And now uh, it, a red jacket orchard uh, has apricot trees on it. And the land behind Rose Hill that was uh, uh, originally part of the farm has been leased for many years to farmers, I think currently Mennonite farmers. And in the 20 years I've been here, they have a steady rotation between corn and uh, corn and soybeans. And that was something in Johnson's time people didn't really consider either. They hadn't thought about cover crops or crop rotation. You know, if you had something that made money, you just, you know, you just planted the same crop year, year in and year out. So the last little section here is just about uh, the Finger Lakes in general, how crops have changed and why. Uh, and probably the biggest change was uh, after the Civil War. Um, when Johnson came here, uh, New York was the breadbasket of the country. The country was a lot smaller, but uh, we grew a lot of wheat here. But then as people started moving westward, uh, there were other areas that could produce even more. So that was one market influence. And the other was um, canning technology. Uh, it, it got better and people in urban areas started creating a demand for uh, canned fruits and vegetables. Uh, the Geneva Preserving Company was created in 1889. And um, at first it was time consuming because the cans were made by hand. And then, of course, we got uh, can factories, and that's how American Can came to be here. Um, by uh, the early 1900s, uh, they were growing produce on 300 acres of land and uh, handling 500 cans a day. And they had all kinds of labels, they uh, different brands, you know, and as the sign says here, fancy canned goods. They would have asparagus and white asparagus and peas and carrots and beets and all kinds of things. And that's really what you see uh, growing around here today, things that are serving the uh, uh, processing industry. This map of the Finger Lakes showing uh, different crops is probably from the 1930s, just based on the prominence of um, all the rail lines here. Um, grapes were pretty much concentrated on Canandaigua and Cuca Lake. You don't really see that here along the others, um, particularly out of area visitors think that we've had wineries for hundreds of years and that's not the case. But um, you can see here, uh, nurseries are still here. A lot of hay, potatoes, grains. Uh, the fruits they refer to are probably uh, orchards, probably uh, apples and peaches. And historically, that's this is where uh, orchards were uh, during the time of um, uh, when the Seneca Nation lived here prior to 1779. I like to use this example because this is an example of where maybe tile drainage was not a great idea. This is the Potter Muck land over between uh, Cuca and Canandaigua Lakes. And uh, Rose Hill has a tour guide who lives, I think, along this road. So uh, this was all swamp land until I don't know exactly when, sometime in the 20th, mid 20th century. And they came in and drained it. They drained off the water to get at the uh, muck soil that is underneath it. It's extremely rich from having all these uh, uh, nutrients and you know decomposed matter in it. So they, uh, they drained it and it's a great area for growing uh, things like potatoes, carrots, and onions. And uh, that area is uh, famous for its onions. Unfortunately, it doesn't really have any kind of binder. And as, it, um, as the nu nutrients wear out, uh, the, the soil literally starts to blow away, like here in these white areas here. And uh, the person we know says, when you're on this road and it's a windy day, um, you can just see this. It's like a snowstorm. The soil is just blowing off the field uh, across the um, across the road. So um, that uh, that's one reason why people have really taken a different view of uh, uh, of draining things. You know, maybe we don't need to drain everything with uh, with water upon it. And these last two uh, slides are just an example of how um, 
you know, farming has really changed. I, I use Peterson Farms as an example because they have a great website, but they're also um, high volume producers. Uh, they began in Seneca Castle in 1983, and now they're up to 900 acres of conventional farming and also 600 acres of organic farming. And that's an area where drainage probably helps quite a bit because you are uh, stop, stopping problems before they can start. Um, you know, you want to handle problems without uh, going in and using chemicals. So I imagine, uh, you know, drainage probably prevents some issues. Um, when they started in the 80s, they were growing for processing companies like a lot of other people. And now they've shifted to uh, fresh produce for the wholesale market. And Wegmans is a big one of them. So um, there's more of a push for organic produce and also for fresh uh, farm to table, something that we're hearing all the time now. So um, this is what they've responded to. I don't know for a fact that they have drain tile on their land, but if they have 15, 1,500 acres, uh, I'm almost sure they do. You know, they, they, they probably have to. So this is just a um, this is just a list of the variety of uh, things that they are growing now. Uh, they've started growing hops that you see on the left. Uh, they've been doing that for quite a while uh, for local breweries that want to uh, use New York hops. But um, in no particular order, they grow asparagus, sweet corn, field corn, which is what a lot of the corn that you see in this area is grown uh, for either grain or to uh, feed to livestock, butternut squash, hops. And the right is Romanesco. I don't know what John Johnson would think of that. Um, I don't know if he would hit it with a shovel or run away from it, but uh, I'm sure he never thought of Romanesco when he was alive. Then of course, cabbage, which we see a lot of, kale, soybeans, rye, and wheat. So they do a little bit of everything. And as I say, that's that's just one farm. There are so many others around here that have uh, likewise adapted to uh, changing markets. So I just want to close out with uh, reminders for those of you who have never seen it or have visited. Uh, we do have the uh, John Johnson's original house and an outbuilding with uh, some of our drain tile collection. Um, we do have the rest of it upstairs in that building. So if you really want to see it, uh, you know, I can, I can make that possible. Um, due to COVID restrictions and the number of people we can have at any one time, um, uh, Johnson House will uh, not be open until July 6th. And at that point, it will be uh, by appointment only. But if you give us a call, we can work something out. And uh, Rose Hill at this point looks like it will be the uh, same as well, but um, we are going to invite people back just as soon as we can. So that is all I have. Are there questions? There are a couple of questions in the chat box. I'll read Great. them. I'll read them to you. The first is what kind of sheep I, did Johnston have to raise? Um, I've read that they were Merino, M-E-R-I-N-O. And um, he was, he was uh, well known for the quality of his mutton. <laughs> okay. Uh, were the horseshoe tiles placed open side, open side up or down? Yep, uh, uh, oh, uh, open side down. And uh, some people just put them right into the ground. Others people, other people would have uh, what they call the sole plate, something flat and hard for it to sit on. And eventually, mm -hmm. um, they started making them that way. So it would be like a horseshoe with a, uh, a flat side on, on the down part. Okay. Um, where was the Geneva Preserving Building located? I always blank on the name, but I think it's down there. It's off of North Street. And now there's a office building there. I think it's a, uh, a dentist. Um, it, it's right. It's right there along the railroad tracks. It's it's North Street, uh, just before you get to Exchange Street. So it's between um, uh, it's between Genesee and uh, uh, Ex Exchange Street, and you can still see a little turn off in there where there's a, a medical office building. Looks very good. And it, it was it was right on a railroad spur, which is where all of these places wanted to be. They wanted to be 
uh, someplace where they could, um, you know, uh, load on and load off. Okay, that's all that's in the chat box. But does anybody else have a question? You can unmute yourself and ask, ask John. This is the time to have any of your burning questions about drain tile finally answered. <laughs> oh, something appeared in the chat box, John. Uh, yeah. Were drain tile fact tile were drain tile factories common in Western New York? Um, and this comes from Jane Oaks, who says we had one in New York, Livingston County, but I don't know where others were. Yeah, I um, I can't really speak beyond this area too much, but we did have quite a few as um, because uh, Johnston wrote in agricultural papers, which were common at the time. So he was he was spreading the gospel of drain tile. And some people <laughs> still thought he was crazy, but others uh, hopped on board and they were like, well, where can I get drain tile? Um, there was uh, there were a couple manual manufacturers uh, in Geneva near the canal. Uh, there were some in Romulus and uh, Ovid. I know the Yerkes uh, company. We have a, a, a postcard from them in Romulus. So it um, it really started uh, taking off. So it wouldn't surprise me, you know, uh, rather than shipping that you know early on anyway that there were uh, local manufacturers. Another question just popped up in the chat. Please comment on Dutch tile or perforated tile. I have not heard of Dutch tile before. Um, and I'm not sure about uh, perforated tile as it relates to clay. Now, of course, the, um, the corrugated plastic tile that I showed has little tiny slits cut in it. Um, my best guess is it may have been uh, a design to let more water into the uh, into the tile lines, um, but even with um, say each if each tile is 16 inches long and then you, you are pressing them close together um, over hundreds of feet, that's still uh, quite a bit of area for the water to uh, find its way into the tile line. But I'll have to look into Dutch tile. The Dutch tile. Anybody yeah. else with a with a question? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. we can hear you. Go uh, right ahead. Okay. Yep, go right okay. ahead. Thank you. This is really interesting. Um, we live, we look up at uh, the Lewis Farm, White Springs uh, Manor House, and then Ravine's Winery. And I assume that maybe they work, the, the Lewis people and the Rose Hills and everybody, they all work together with Johnston on draining, draining the fields. Do you know the White Springs Farm? Yeah, I I don't. Um, I'm I'm trying to think who was who was owning it at that time. You know, because um, Johnson started in 1835, and really by 1840s, 1850s is when it was starting to take off. So um, I think the Lewises I, owned it at that point, okay. but I can't be sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, it would. Uh, I think I think at that point it was still a matter of opinion whether they believed it or not. You know, if they. No. Uh, if they embraced it. And uh, Johnston certainly had the numbers to back it up that um, he was getting a higher yield. So uh, I, I don't know the answer. Okay. Actually, hey, thank you. Charlie? Yeah. Go ahead, Charlie. The Lewises uh, came later. I think that land was owned by the Nicholases when, when the, he was the brother-in-law of, of Robert Rose when they came here. Nicholases was on that side of the lake and Rose was on the other side. And I would imagine drain tile came into play. Okay. And I think Sally Fox, you had your hand up. Go ahead with your question. I, I am a descendant of John Johnston's and have oh, a couple great. of family pieces that, that were brought over from Scotland. <laughs> and uh, and his wife got, got shipwrecked in Nova Scotia. Anyway, much longer story. Um, I can remember visiting the house there long before things were fixed up, before the winery was there and all that. And he, his library, I recall, he had a first edition of Webster's Dictionary. Oh. Dude, is there, I mean, is there something like this? Is his library still around or anything? Uh, yes. Uh, the, um, uh, a, lot, a lot of those, um, uh, a lot of the archival things, you know, all the papers, whether it's uh, old newspapers or journals or uh, books, are uh, preserved in the archives over on South Main Street in, in the museum where we can uh, have better control over them than, uh, than in the house. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we do, we do have all those. That's great. 
Any other questions or comments for John? Oh, I will read this. Um, great job on the talk. I'm a dairy farmer that started putting tile in the ground when I was probably around eight years, eight years old. 60 years later, I'm putting tile in the ground. It's a lot easier today with better equipment, plastic tile instead of four, four foot clay tile pieces that you laid in the ditch by hand. And this is coming from William Young. I've learned quite a bit from uh, farmers and tile installers uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, if I could footnote them, I, I would. Um, they've, they've corrected a lot of my uh, mistakes, <laughs> but uh, a lot of stories about working with that old, uh, old clay, which would really cut up your hands if you weren't wearing gloves. Uh, I've also heard the stories about the modern machines with their laser levels. Uh, at least once they went through and uh, did an entire field and uh, there was no drainage. And they went back and discovered the laser, uh, the laser level was broken and nobody checked it. No, you know, in the old days, you would uh, throw some water in your ditch to make sure it was running downhill. So they had, <laughs> they, they had they laid it perfectly level. It, there was no slope to it. So uh, oh. it's always something. Uh -huh. Okay, any other questions or comments? Oh. Okay. Okay, I want to thank everybody for joining us today and thanks to John. Very interesting as always. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Again, if you're interested in any of our future programs in March, you can visit our website at www.genevahistoricalsociety.com where we have programs towards the end of the month. Um, thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, John. That was a wonderful talk. <laughs>